Hi, I'm Alan Boswell, and welcome to The Horn. To many of you, the guest today won't need any introduction. Nanjala Nyabola is a prolific political analyst and commentator on Kenyan politics and the wider region. She's also the author of Digital Democracy, Analog Politics. Her book investigates the intersection of politics and technology in Kenya. Today, we'll also discuss the political revolutions in Ethiopia and Sudan. Nanjala, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. First of all, congratulations on the book. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, your book is about how politics and technology, but new media in particular, have collided in Kenya. Can you tell us a bit more about what you found in your research? I think one of the most interesting outcomes from the research is the connection between what's happening in Kenya with what's happening sort of all over the world. We kind of have this... When we talk about tech and politics, there's always this um, sort of dual um, approach or dual v- viewpoint where people think that because things are happening in the West, because things are happening in the States, they're happening in the UK, that they could not be happening in other parts of the world. And so um, when you think about how, for example, tech combines with elections, a lot of the things that the UK is freaking out about now with regards to Brexit, um, the fallout from the US 2016 election, those are things that Kenyans have been dealing with since 2013. Those are things that India has been dealing with um, since 2011, the influence of money, technology sort of coming together and impacting politics, I think, um, was a really interesting outcome. You warn about digital colonialism, also conflict entrepreneurs. I'm just wondering if you could explain exactly what you mean by both of those terms. Well, when it comes to digital colonialism, I use I, I build that off the definition of colonialism, and which is preceded by private corporations coming to Africa, going to Asia, going to Latin America, um, sort of trying to set up private enterprise and then finding that the circumstances for the private enterprise were not necessarily ideal and bringing in their parent states um, to come and protect their interests and to use force and to use violence in order to protect the commercial interests. When I think about what's happening with tech, I see this pattern whereby um, Otimo for Safran, the French company that actually built the tech behind the Kenyan election, gets involved. It's all very dubious. It's all very illegal. Even the parliament said, you know, everything that happened with the single source procurement, not being able to produce the database when it was demanded, all of that was completely against what the contract said that they were supposed to do. And then we sort of complain about it. And what happens? Mo for Safran threatens Kenya with a lawsuit in France for defamation. And it becomes a whole diplomatic conversation about um, the French government and the Kenyan government, even though it was actually a private tender. There's a private company. And um, I see an accountability gap in there that reminds me of, of the power dynamics of the colonial era. I see my inability as a Kenyan citizen to hold a French company um accountable. And I see that as very reminiscent of how maybe my great grandparents might have felt about wanting there to be some kind of of having some kind of agency in the political space and not being able to do that because of the way the power structure is set up. So for me, digital colonialism is really about private corporations opening up the, the space for economically powerful countries to intervene in the political spaces, the political organization of less powerful, con- economically powerful countries. And of course, that's that's one example. Another example on a, on a larger scale is Facebook, Twitter, all these very large companies, which are all based in the U.S. and are essentially only accountable regulation-wise to the U.S. To the US. Some Western countries, or, or some or Europe's also trying to to enact some regulation. But, you know, and, and, and Myanmar is the famous example mm-hmm. um, of where that can go terribly wrong. But it, it's it's um, having an effect uh, all across the world. And, and these companies are not really accountable to the places where their technologies are causing all these issues. Absolutely. I mean, and, and you know, a lot of um, Western analysis wants us to worry about Huawei in China. And that actually is something that I'm concerned about. I think about Zimbabwe building smart cities and using Chinese technology to increase their surveillance capacity and not being able to provide basic health care and not being able to provide, um, you know, an economy, a, st- a functional economy. Um, but it's not just a Chinese problem. We have a, a multi-level or a multilateral, if you will, um, challenge, especially in Africa, because it's coming at us from all directions. We're getting American companies, as you mentioned, Facebook, Twitter, Google, 
not responsive to Kenyan legislature, but we're also getting Chinese companies building the surveillance architecture that we have here in Kenya. Um, we have European companies um, getting involved in our elections. And as a citizen, I kind of look around and I think, well, where do I get protection? Where do I get accountability? And that is the big outstanding question that I felt I, I wanted to leave readers with, um, with it, at the end of my book is all of this stuff is happening. So what what are citizens going to do about it? Where where do they act? You know, did you think there is any sort of justice which came about due to the scandal that Cambridge Analytica found itself in or not really? Because essentially what they got in trouble for was how they meddled in U.S. and U.K. elections. That's precisely it. I think the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal is really a reminder of how little concern there is for the well-being of African citizens. And can you just remind everyone what Cambridge sure. Analytica did here? So between 2011 and 2013, they were uh, involved with the Kenyatta campaign. At the time, it was a Jubilee Alliance, uh, not a political party yet, um, administered a large survey, um, 47,000 people. The Jubilee uh, Alliance basically paid for Cambridge Analytica to help them influence their digital um, messaging. That's what is confirmed. Um, I, I have a law degree, so I have to be careful about what I say. Um, <laughs> and we know we know that the um, administration spent a significant amount of money um, on that in political influence campaign. We know that it had to do with the messaging around the International Criminal Court, because until 2013, the president and the deputy president, current president, deputy president were facing um, charges at the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. And so we know it had to do with shifting the messaging around that. And you saw it because in 2000 and 2010, 2011, the messaging was don't be vague, go to Hague. Let's have accountability for the crimes against humanity perpetrated during the 2007, 2008 post-election violence. In 2012, it is suddenly, oh, the ICC is a tool of Western imperialism. And all of the narrative about accountability and history and memorization, it's all gone. The IDPs are still IDPs. We still don't have anybody who's been charged for anything that happened in 2007, 2008. And so for us who have to live with the consequences of that, it is, you know, ethnic politics is tough. And, and it is really difficult to move away from and address properly. And so when a foreign company comes into your political space to incite that, it's almost a personal slight. <laughs> um, it is a personal slight. I take that very personally, and I know a lot of Kenyans do too. But I'm also struck by the irony of the fact that the Jubilees, Jubilees messaging around 2007, uh, 2011 was that the ICC is a tool of Western imperialism. So let's pay a British company to come <laughs> and tell people <laughs> that this is happening. Um, but broadly speaking, um, that's that's what happened. And that that involvement kind of stretches out into 2017. 2017, we know that the Jubilee, for the 2017 general election, Kenya, we know that the Jubilee administration paid 60,000 US dollars, it's about 6 million shillings, um, to retain Cambridge Analytica services. And then in 2017, in late 2018, then suddenly the story broke in mm. the UK and it was like, oh, wait, yeah. <laughs> Could is there anyone out there who might know what this means and what was happening? It's like, well, in India, people have been talking about this. In Kenya, we've been talking about it. In Nigeria, we've been talking about it. We just didn't know who to tell. I think there's something so invasive about interfering in someone else's elections. and yeah. And it didn't take until it happened in really American elections, I think, for a lot of people to really under understand that. And and still, there hasn't been a big push to really hold these companies accountable for their actions in other places in the world. I think the only place where there's been significant sustained attention has been in the UK. And that is because Brexit is a life or death thing for a lot of people. And um, I think a lot of UK journalists have been incredibly tenacious about this. And but that is an outlier. Mm. Um, and of course, in, in other countries, really the lack of accountability is the fact that the brand Cambridge Analytica is going to die. It is now a new company, same directors, same everything. It's re-emerging. You know, everybody who left in the previous scandal got a book deal out of it. 
And um, but the only country where we've seen people actually try to put the pieces of the puzzle together is in the UK. Um, it's getting overshadowed because October 31st. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Everything's getting overshadowed. Everything's getting overshadowed. Um, but the challenge in Kenya was that the opposition also invested heavily in an analytics mm. operation. And it's one of those um, pot calling the kettle black situations. Who's going to ask for accountability when everybody's kind of spent money on the same thing? Now, your book is about Kenya, but I also read a larger critique in it. Uh, you write, contemporary political analysis of African countries is stunted by a crisis of imagination. What did you mean? I think when I, when I read books about Africa, I, I see, and I say this in my introduction, I don't see myself. And I therefore, I don't see what my space for action is as an ordinary person. Do I actually matter in the Kenyan political space or... Am I just uh, desire? Am I just deigned to constantly be a consequence? You know, they fight, and then I get to know where what happens next. And I, by I, I mean as an ordinary citizen. So that's the, the that's the crisis of imagination to me. It's it's failing to see the spaces for ordinary people, um, where ordinary people demonstrate agency and creativity and and frustration and all of the, that stuff, and therefore failing to to articulate clearly what um, political action f could look like away from power, away from powerful people. And I think another frame on that that's often used here is 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 the framing of tribalism, that yeah. these politics are very tribal. Um, we both bristle at the use of, of tribal in Kenyan politics. Um, some take this as a denial that ethnic politics is very salient um, in Kenya, which of course couldn't be um, further from the truth. Um, but what does calling the politics here tribalism, what does it get wrong? Well, it misses out on how fluid the idea of tribe is. It's not tied to any objective biological fact. It's something that serves a very, a social, very specific social and political function in a particular moment. But when the social political function changes, um, your ethnic group can change. And the best example of this is the experience of women. 51% of the Kenyan population is w women. The writer, Rasna Wara, uh, during the last census, she's ethnically uh, Asian. She was counted as Taita Shaveta because how ethnicity plays out in Kenya is that the husband's ethnicity becomes the family's ethnicity. But she's clearly not Taita. And this is how the count has gone down. If you get married most times as a woman, you lose your ethnic identity. This underscores the fluidity. But... If you focus on where ethnicity is at its hardest, which is where it's at its most contested, that's going to be in electoral politics. That's going to be in power um, play, you know, the, the power play between the different patriarchs. You're necessarily going to overstate the impact that it has on general life. Um, you're going to miss out on how people utilize it, instrumentalize it and negotiate it. And like you said, it's not. We're not saying that it doesn't matter. We're not saying that it's not a thing. We're not saying that we're saying that it might not be the thing that people think that it is. I think there's also a causation problem, um, which is that is it really ethnic politics that's destroying the the country, or is it that the winner take all political structure in a way is causing the rise of these ethnic politics in such a way that is really damaging the country. And this this is the discussion that I have in the book is I is exactly that is are we in overstating the importance of ethnicity making it more important than it actually is. It's the thing we can study. It's the thing we can analyze. It's the thing we can blame. It's the thing we can use to explain. And so we overstate its importance and then we miss out on other things that are just as important on other things that are just as salient um, to the narrative. Because if you look at the powerful patriarchs, the big families in Kenya, you'll notice that a lot of them, they're mar related by marriage. And we think we speak about their ethnic um, contestation as if it is immutable, as if it is essential, essential. Yeah. 
but really what it is is its utility is it's serving a very specific function in the power contest so they lean on it in that context yeah um now to move on from from Kenya you know you write a book on the intersection of politics and technology out here in the the Horn of Africa region uh, and then we have these tectonic shifts in Ethiopia in Sudan um, did these surprise you I thought that Sudan would fall apart first because the centralized military regimes in both cases was clearly fraying at the edges. In Ethiopia, I was in Afar, in the Danakil area. Um, in Sudan, I went all around and... When was this? Um, this was in 2016. Okay. And what you notice about Sudan at the time, two-thirds of the country was inaccessible. You couldn't go to Darfur. You couldn't go to the Nuba Mountains. You couldn't go to Blue Nile. You couldn't go to Kordofan. You could only travel in this little tiny triangle in the east. And even then, you couldn't go all the way up to the border with Egypt because there was a conflict there also. And um, the I always I felt that Sudan was more unstable than Ethiopia because of the scale of the conflict. It's a war economy. Um, but I, I also had the sense that Ethiopia was on a precipice. Um, the main difference was that Sudanese people were very open about their frustration with the Bashir administration, whereas Ethiopians were still very um, reluctant to directly criticize the administration, very reluctant to engage in political discourse. And I was so I was surprised by the fact that Ethiopia had this massive change. And I think what happened in Ethiopia was sort of the regime also realizing that this thing is not going to hold much longer. What do you think we learned in Ethiopia and Sudan? Do you think we maybe underestimated the degree to which these new mediums really uh, give people more power compared to the state? I think I think we did. I think that the most important factor that people know but don't seem to internalize is that we are a very young region. And what digital technologies have done, what social media, new media has done, it's given young people a voice that they don't have on traditional media, that they don't have in politics, that they don't really have in any other space. And so because these spaces were treated with so much disdain by power, it's like, oh, they're just posting pictures of food and fashion and all of that stuff. People are able to organize in those spaces and become really powerful voices. Look at the Zone 9 bloggers in Ethiopia. I mean, these are nine incredibly young um, people who were able to speak the truth to power in their blog in a way that newspapers weren't able to do, in a way that radio wasn't able to do, in a way that television wasn't able to do. You see the same thing in Sudan. The most powerful critiques that are coming against that came against the Bashir administration towards the end were all young people who, you know, are tweeting, they're on Facebook, they're running blogs, they are doing all these things online that the offline does not give them the ability to do. That does not in any way, I always have to caveat this, that does not in any way negate what people were doing. Because you look at Al Jarida in Sudan, the newspaper, that would have entire print runs confiscated week after week after week for what they were criticizing the state for. It's just saying that there's, a, there's also this other potent space that was coalescing and power was very disdainful of it. And so it managed to become incredibly powerful. And of course, the online is not separate from the offline. It's not. In Sudan, they, you know, when they shut off the internet, they had to focus more on their neighborhood committees and really mobilizing at a grassroots level. Absolutely. And where you get the most out of it is where people are able to do both. Really, the potency comes from being able to take stuff, that organizing energy from the online, matching it up with the structures that exist offline, being able to keep the conversation going even when the internet is shut down and using the internet to amplify at the very uh, powerful spaces. You know, look at Cameroon. We're going to see a lot more of these conversations happening, and we need to pay attention to them. Now, of course, this cuts both ways. Uh, these digital technologies don't always um, necessarily balance towards the, the people. Um, sometimes they also give the states, you know, uh, the state uh, significantly more power. Um, I remember I was reporting on the protests that were being attempted in Khartoum back in 2011. And it was it was interesting because actually 
At that time, the protesters were using Facebook and other ways to mobilize, and the state found in some ways crude, but in other ways kind of sophisticated ways of using the digital technologies against them. They would arrest people, torture them, make them open up their Facebook accounts, and then use that to find out everyone else. They would use the, sometimes they would post, the the state security would post, you know, there was going to be a protest somewhere, and then just wait for all the protesters to show up, then just round them up. Uh, so, so, and this is a constant battle, I think, you know, there's always a give and a take and a push, and a push and a pull. Um, you know, how optimistic are you that in the ultimate um, in the ultimate uh, equation that this is going to, you know, benefit people more than power? I'm, I have to be honest, I'm less optimistic today than I was a couple of years ago. And the reason why I'm less optimistic is because of what's happening with the companies. It's because of the failure by the companies to really see what their political role is. Um, you've mentioned Sudan, but this happened in Ethiopia also um, at, during the worst of the protests that um, people, the state would get access to people's Facebook accounts. And you had one protester, for example, whose entire family, he posted on a Facebook, he put a pic, Facebook post in Australia, his entire family in Ethiopia was arrested. And this is a, th- at the time, I think the optimism came from the fact that at least, at the very least, the companies were letting people do whatever they wanted. Now that we're seeing more attention, corporate attention being paid to Africa as a market, not as people, not as citizens, not as whatever, but as a market, as a potential space for making money, that makes me more concerned about the alliances that are going to come. Um, Ethiopia is liberalizing its telecoms space. Um all over the world, you can sort of kind of hear the the cash registers kind of ringing. That's 110 million people. Um, how much money there could be made from that? Okay, but Ethiopia is still in a very politically fraught moment. Are we going to see the rights of people sacrificed in the interests of of profit? Um, so this is these are some of the concerns. I mean, you see the all, all over the world, the digital has become central to protest. It's become central to narrative. It's become central to mobilization. It's become central to how people explain what their protests are about. But we have different varying uh, levels of engagement from the companies. In some cases, they position themselves as allies to the protesters, to the resistances. In some cases, they position themselves as um pseudo neutral actors and especially where you don't want them to be neutral when it comes to white supremacy when it comes to racist uh, you don't want them to be neutral in situations like that and then in um, other cases they are diametrically opposed to the protesters either by going along with shutdowns or with providing information and this is this has become increasingly it's, common the the shutting down of the internet as or WhatsApp absolutely. as one of the first first tools that the state power has towards first trying to suppress. line of fire, first line of defense mm-hmm. even and this is not and again this is not an African thing Hong Kong first thing they do you know let's switch off the internet this is this is why I'm a little bit less optimistic is I don't think that the the the, the, the digital companies social networks. Uh, app builders, platforms, whatever, I don't think that they see themselves as having a political obligation to the people who use the platforms. The other question which is often raised about these technologies and social media in particular is whether they ultimately unite people or whether or not they divide them. Um, (laughs) Now, now I think to some degree, Ethiopia and Sudan offer interesting Mm -hmm. countering examples here. Of course, Sudan is a remarkable story of a people which had been heavily divided by their government really Mm -hmm. come together. And then in Ethiopia, we've seen the effect of this largely mobilization on ethnic lines really increasing. Um, So yeah, are you worried uh, that online communities might end up only increasing polarization and identity politics? What on online is an amplifier. In Sudan, the call for unity is basically has been the call of the Sudanese resistance even before there was a digital, that the rejection of the polarization by the state. In Ethiopia, you had a state that had mandatory unity, mandatory national identity, mandatory national language, all of these things. And so the centrifugal force is basically people saying, actually, I would rather be Oromia. I would rather be, you know, Amara. I would rather have that smaller localized identity. And the digital is amplifying that. And so what's that's essentially why... My overarching argument is we have to understand the societies 
as individual societies, not as quote unquote Africa or quote unquote the developing world. We have to understand what was there before because it's necessarily going to amplify digital is going to amplify whatever it finds and reacts to whatever it finds in that specific society. This is such a fascinating topic, and I think we could talk about it for a very <laughs> long time. Uh, before I let you go, I wanted to make sure I asked you, how worried are you about Kenya's 2022 elections? <laughs> oh, um, I think anyone who doesn't have a significant measure of concern is deluded. I think there, the fact that we are not, that um, the president can't run again raises the stakes. And I think everybody senses that. But the thing that always gives me hope in Kenya is ultimately Kenyan people. And we have shown time and time again that people really just want this country to work. Um, so it's going to be a tension between what the politicians want and what the people want. Um, but overall, I think anybody who isn't concerned isn't paying attention. Nanjala, thanks so much for <laughs> coming on our podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell. This episode was produced by Mae Francis. 